1965, EMD rolled out what looked like the future of freight power. The SD45 locomotive powered by the new 2645 engine promised 3,600 horsepower in a single unit, 600 more than anything EMD had built before. The sales pitch was clean, the math looked solid, and orders started flowing from railroad executives. But what they got instead was an upgrade that backfired. By the mid-1960s, freight railroads were chasing horsepower like drag racers, chasing quarter-mile times. Trains were getting heavier, grades weren't getting any flatter, and labor agreements meant that adding locomotives often meant adding crew costs. EMD's turbocharged 16-cylinder 645 engines had proven themselves tough and reliable in the SD40 series. So stepping up to 20 cylinders looked like the cleanest path to more power without reinventing the entire platform. The engineering logic was straightforward. Take the proven 645 engine block, stretch it to accommodate four more cylinders, and boost the output from 3,000 to 3,600 horsepower. The SD45 used similar electrical systems and traction motors as the SD40, leveraging existing maintenance experience. While higher horsepower suggested greater potential tonnage, real-world gains often depended on rail conditions and adhesion limits rather than just engine output. The horsepower race had been building since the late 1950s. When EMD introduced the GP20 in 1959 with 2,000 horsepower, it seemed like plenty of power for most applications. By 1965, the GP30 was pushing 2,250 horsepower, and the SD35 was rated at 2,500 horsepower from a turbocharged 16567D3A, a power level that pushed the 567 toward its practical limits and set the stage for the 645 series. Each step up the power ladder brought new customers and new applications, especially for long, heavy trains climbing western mountain grades and carrying bulk freight across vast distances. Union Pacific was an early adopter and one of the loudest voices asking for more horsepower per unit on Western grades. The logic was simple. Fewer locomotives in the consist, one crew moving the same or greater tonnage, and better schedule reliability. The SD45 promised a leap forward in operational efficiency on paper, leading mechanical departments to anticipate that the 2645 would lower costs for big trains. They certainly got more power, but the service reality made those economic gains hard to achieve. Other major roads, including Santa Fe and the lines that became Burlington Northern, committed to SD45s for heavy freight. The railroad press called it EMD's answer to the horsepower race, and industry analysts predicted that 4,000 horsepower locomotives were just around the corner. The 2645 engine looked like the logical evolution of diesel power, building on the proven 645 platform that had powered thousands of successful locomotives. On paper, 3,600 horsepower per unit solved the power shortfalls that had plagued heavy freight operations since the end of steam. The problem was that paper doesn't have to deal with physics, metallurgy, or the harsh realities of railroad service. The physics of the 2645 were about to teach EMD and their customers an expensive lesson about the difference between theoretical power and usable power. The trouble started almost immediately and it began with the engine itself. The 20-cylinder installation was longer and heavier than the 16-cylinder baseline, and that mattered. Extra mass changed how loads traveled through the block and mounts, and shops started seeing stresses they didn't chase on the shorter engines. None of this shows up in a brochure. It shows up when availability slips and inspections turn into repairs. Under load, particularly during dynamic braking or rapid throttle changes, the crankshaft would flex and twist like a giant steel spring. This created stress concentrations at the main bearing journals, leading to premature bearing failures and, in the worst cases, complete crankshaft brakes that could destroy the entire engine. The crankshaft was a massive forging, but its length amplified torsional loads. When resonance lined up, bearings paid the price. The crankcase became another weak point. The 2645 shared much of the architecture with the 16645, but the longer block introduced stresses and vibrations that weren't present in the shorter engines. Railroad maintenance crews reported crankcase cracks, 
particularly around the main bearing caps, that required welding repairs or complete engine replacement. Oil leaks became chronic problems as the flexing crankcase distorted gasket surfaces and loosened bolted joints. What should have been routine 92-day inspections became major overhauls, and locomotives that were supposed to increase fleet availability were spending noticeably more time in the shop than comparable SD40s. The 2645 relied on EMD's mechanically-assisted turbocharger, a design combining a gear-driven compressor and exhaust-driven turbine, to push enough air into 20 cylinders. That setup could make the power, but it also pushed air and heat management harder than the 16-cylinder sets. In tough conditions, crews sometimes had to temper the throttle to keep temperatures where the engine would live all day. But the mechanical problems were only half the story. The bigger issue was adhesion, the ability to convert engine power into tractive effort without spinning the wheels. With DC traction of the era, adhesion protection often capped how much of that 3,600 horsepower actually reached the rail. When wheel slip started, protection logic pulled back to save the motors. On paper, the SD45 had the edge. On wet rail or steep grades, the usable advantage narrowed fast. Railroad operating departments quickly learned to work around these limitations. Some railroads re-rated their SD45 units with the 2645 down to about 3,000 horsepower using governor and rack adjustments. In daily service, that effectively turned them into expensive SD40s, which tells you everything about how the economics shook out. Others were reassigned to flatter territory where peak horsepower mattered less than sustained pulling power. By the early 1970s, Union Pacific and other roads were shifting new orders to the SD-40-2. Fuel burn ran higher than the 16-cylinder sets, and when railroad accountants calculated cost per ton mile, the metric that actually determined locomotive assignments and purchasing decisions, the SD-40-2 consistently came out ahead. The SD-45 cost more to buy, burned more fuel, and required more maintenance. EMD built 1,260 SD-45s between 1965 and 1971, respectable for a premium locomotive. They built over 3,900 SD-40-2s over a much longer production run, and the market had spoken. Railroads wanted power they could count on, not brochure horsepower that came with asterisks and operating restrictions. 25 years later, EMD decided to try again. The SD80 Mac, introduced in 1995, paired a 20-cylinder 710 engine with AC traction technology that promised to solve the adhesion problems that had plagued the SD45. At 5,000 horsepower, the SD80 Mac was EMD's flagship high-horsepower single-engine freight unit at the time, and this time the physics should have worked in its favor. The SD80 Mac powered by EMD's 20-cylinder 710, arrived with a stiffer crankcase and improved controls compared to 1960s hardware, and AC traction finally gave big horsepower real adhesion. The physics looked solved. The fleet math did not. Better torsional damping and closer monitoring reduced the vibration complaints that dogged the earlier 20-cylinder effort. AC traction motors could handle much higher power levels without the thermal problems that had limited the SD45. AC inverters modulated torque with far finer control than DC gear, so the SD80 Mac with a 2710 could hold adhesion where DC would slip. That's the advantage railroads were paying for. For crews, the net effect was steadier handling. Controls trimmed just enough torque at the right axle to keep the train hooked up instead of yanking power across the whole unit. Conrail ordered all 30 SD80 Macs that EMD would ultimately build, planning to use them on heavy coal trains between the Midwest and East Coast ports. The railroad's mechanical department had been impressed by early tests of AC traction technology and saw the SD80 Mac as a way to reduce the number of locomotives needed for their heaviest trains. In heavy service, the SD80 Mac with a 2710 could reduce units on some trains, but the benefit depended on how a railroad ran its territory. The moment you zoom out to inventory, training, and parts, a tiny 20-cylinder subfleet became a tough sell. In heavy coal service, they showed starting and low-speed pull that DC fleets struggled to match on steep territory. 
AC traction kept more of the power usable at low speed and on bad rail. And wheel slip control let crew stay in the throttle instead of having the whole unit pull back. But solving the technical problems didn't solve the business case. And the business case was where the SD80 Mac ultimately failed. A fleet of 30 unique locomotives meant separate parts inventory for components that weren't shared with any other locomotive model. The 2710 G3B engine used different pistons, connecting rods and cylinder heads than the 16710 engines in EMD's other AC locomotives. The turbocharger was a unique model sized specifically for the 20-cylinder application. Maintenance training became another issue. Conrail's mechanical department had to develop separate procedures for the SD80 Mac, and only certain shop facilities had the overhead cranes capable of handling the longer, heavier engine. When major repairs were needed, locomotives often had to be deadheaded hundreds of miles to shops equipped to handle them. The fuel consumption curves didn't match the rest of Conrail's roster either. The SD80 Max consumed more fuel per hour when operating at high output. Unless used at or near their maximum capacity, the fuel cost often outweighed any potential crew savings from running fewer locomotives. After the 1999 Conrail split, the SD80 Max were divided between Norfolk Southern and CSX, and neither ordered more. No follow-up North American orders appeared as roads standardized on 16-cylinder AC fleets. Both companies moved towards standard 16-cylinder platforms. CSX leaned on SD70 Max and GE AC Power, while Norfolk Southern built large 16710 DC fleets with SD70 and SD70M units, then added AC Power later with GE AC 4400 CW and ES44 AC and EMD SD70 ACE models. The economics were stark. An SD70 Mac at about 4300 horsepower could handle most assignments that called for an SD80 Mac while sharing parts with a much larger fleet. The small percentage of assignments where the SD80 Max extra power made a difference weren't enough to justify maintaining a separate fleet of unique locomotives. Norfolk Southern kept their SD80 Max longer, using them primarily on coal trains in West Virginia, where the combination of heavy tonnage and steep grades made the extra power valuable. But even NS began retiring the units in the 2010s as newer 16-cylinder AC locomotives with improved software and traction control systems could match their performance. The SD45 with a 2645 and the SD80 Mac with a 2710 tell the same story separated by three decades of technological progress. Both locomotives were engineering successes that became commercial failures because they solved the wrong problem. Railroads don't buy horsepower, they buy cost per ton mile and fleet availability, metrics where the 20-cylinder engines consistently lost to their 16-cylinder siblings. The SD45 era exposed the limits of DC traction technology. While the 2645 could generate impressive horsepower, DC systems of the 1960s struggled to fully convert that power into usable tractive effort on the rails, especially on slippery tracker grades. Railroad mechanical departments learned to derate the engines or restrict their assignments, essentially admitting that the extra cylinders were more trouble than they were worth. The SD80 Mac era proved that solving technical problems doesn't automatically create market success. AC traction finally gave big horsepower the adhesion it needed, but by then railroads had learned the value of fleet standardization. A small pool of unique locomotives, no matter how capable, couldn't compete with the economies of scale that came from operating hundreds of identical units. The irony is that very large engines make perfect sense in other applications. Marine installations routinely use 20-cylinder and larger engines because ships can accommodate the size and weight, and the duty cycles favor maximum power over frequent starts and stops. Stationary power plants use massive engines because maintenance can be scheduled around demand and fuel efficiency matters more than parts commonality. But North American freight railroads operate in a different world, where locomotives must be interchangeable, maintainable by crews across thousands of miles of territory, and economical enough to justify their capital cost across decades of service. In that environment, 
the 16-cylinder platforms with AC traction that EMD and GE developed in the 1990s hit the sweet spot of power, reliability, and fleet economics. The verdict was clear by 2000. Fewer cylinders, AC traction, and common platforms you could buy by the hundred, won bids and moved freight profitably. The 20-cylinder era had risen fast on the promise of more power per unit, but it fell faster when railroads realized that the best upgrade wasn't always the biggest one.